Thank you, Roger. And, uh, and then just another announcement, too. You know that, uh, or you, you, you may know, if you've been coming around, we have hired a new associate pastor, Clay Smith. He'll be here, in fact, next Monday, a week from tomorrow. Um, and in that transition, I, I need to read this. The welcoming committee is excited to announce they're getting a welcome basket together uh, for Clay, just like you all did for Wendy and I when we got here. It meant a lot uh, for us to receive that welcome basket. And so our welcome committee is at it again. Uh, they'll have a gift card tree uh, at one of the desks in the lobby on the 28th and May 5th. Uh, or you can give uh, cards directly to Miss Cindy Westbrook or Amy Woodson by May 19th. And then they uh, wanted me to tell you they're trying to keep this a secret as much as possible. Uh, I'm telling you it's not a secret because Clay's probably watching right now. Um, so, Clay, if you're watching right now, surprise. So we're not going to be announcing it much more after uh, today, but know you can still contribute a gift card through May the 19th, and you'll be reading more about this. Uh, in our weekly newsletter as well, and you can talk to Cindy or Amy if you got any questions. Uh, also to let you know, um, today is the next to last Sunday in this current series, so, so one more week next Sunday, uh, we'll wrap up the series, and then after that, we're going to jump back into the book of Genesis, and so some of you might remember that we had these Genesis journals that we made available to you back in the fall, and, and if you weren't here for uh, that series. Basically, it's just uh, the, the words of God, the, the book of Genesis on one side of the page and then the note page on the other. And, uh, and so we still have some of those journals, like 12 of them left. We sold over 100 of them, but we've got like 12 left. And so uh, I want to encourage you in two weeks to bring your journal back with you, those of you who have them. And if you uh, didn't get one or maybe you weren't here at the time and you'd like to purchase one, they're $5. And it's just kind of first come, first serve, the last 12. And so they'll be out there at the blue table in the lobby as well. So, lots, lots of information to share with you today. Um, today we are continuing the series, The Church, Culture, and Politics. And this series has been designed to make us feel a little uncomfortable, and yet hopefully, at the end, make us all better. Because after all, the church uh, should be the safest place for us to talk about lots of things including politics. Um, but here's the tension, and this is where we left off last week. And, and the tension is really in a question, are we willing to put our faith filter ahead of our political filter? Can, can we do that? Can we put our faith filter ahead of our political filter? Are we willing to say that we are first and foremost followers of Jesus, and then after that, we're, you know, we're Republican or, or Democrat or Libertarian or whatever else that we might be? In other words, are we willing to follow Jesus when following Jesus puts a distance, puts a gap, puts a space between us and our political party? Um, between us and, and uh, a political system or a political platform or our preferred political candidate. And to be clear, because I think some of you misunderstood, I'm not suggesting that you not talk about politics. Um, I'm not suggesting that you not vote. I for sure think we should be taking an interest in what's happening in our nation. However, what I am suggesting is that we take seriously the words of Jesus and not allow our current political climate to divide us, the people of the church. Because um, the one thing that Jesus prayed for, as much as anything else, it was the thing he prayed for before he was crucified, was that his body, his movement, his, the ecclesia, the church, uh, would be one, that we would be united um, that we would figure out a way to disagree politically and yet um, remain unconditionally in support of one another, loving each other, and always striving for unity. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, jumping into our context today, um, in the first century, there was something that they had in common that I think uh, we see in our culture today, in the first century, everybody wanted Jesus on their side. 
Uh, everybody wanted a piece of Jesus. They wanted him to choose a side, and I think that's true today. If I were given an assignment, if somebody were to come up to me and say, Pastor Alex, could you, would you be capable of, uh, if we asked you to, would you please give a sermon on um, the principles of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and, and make them in alignment with Republican Party politics. Could you do that? The answer is yes, I could. Uh, if someone came up to me and said, hey, could you do a sermon uh, that would take the teachings of Jesus and put them in alignment with the Democratic Party and their platform, believe it or not, I could do that. I could do it from that point of view as well, because when you interpret the words of Jesus through your personal political filter, it's incredible how many times he agrees with you. And so the question is this, can we put our faith filter ahead of our political filter? And it is very difficult to do. This is not easy. Um, But I'm going to try to show you today uh, a, a way forward. And so before we do that, let me just pray real quick. Um, Lord, I pray that you would uh, speak through me. I pray that you would speak in spite of me. Um, What we do not know, God, teach us. And what we do not have, equip us. And what we are not yet, form us into the image of your son, Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Tony Evans is a a famous American pastor out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and he once was quoted as saying this, Jesus did not come to take sides, he came to take over. And I think Dr. Evans is absolutely right. Jesus came to introduce us, you and I, to the kingdom of God. This is what we've been talking about for weeks now, that we are citizens of the kingdom first, and then we are citizens of whatever country we're a part of second. And when Jesus came, he introduced us to a new set of values. These are things that we, again, just talked about in our Sermon on the Mount series, and when we talked about living a kingdom-centered life, he, Jesus came and talked about a kingdom where those who have wealth and power leverage their wealth and power for those who don't have power and for those who have less resources. Um, He talked about a kingdom where the king would lay down his life for his subjects rather than his subjects laying down their life for the king. He talked about a kingdom that was so broad and inclusive that he said, you know what, everybody is invited to participate in this kingdom. But the thing about the kingdom of God is it will always, and in some detail and in some level, always be in conflict with the kingdoms of men. And the kingdom of God will always, at some level and in some detail, conflict with your political party and the platform of your political party or our political candidates. So again, it's foolish for us as believers to be divided because we're supposed to be kingdom people first and political people second. But again, that's very difficult to do. And so today I want to give you a formula to help us understand, and this will be an interesting sermon, but I I, want to give you a formula that, that will help us understand where agreement ends and diverse opinions begin. In other words, why we always won't see things eye to eye as believers, why we will always disagree. And so if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Now, to give this talk a a little bit of a backdrop before we jump in, I, I, I want to start with the Apostle Paul. You might remember the Apostle Paul. He steps into the pages of history, as you likely know, as someone who despised Christians. He was uh, a Jewish man. Uh, He was a Pharisee. He was brilliant. He was super educated. 
And eventually, he does indeed become a follower of Jesus. And in two of his letters that he wrote to the church that we have in Scripture, Paul uses a phrase that I think gives us a starting point for putting together this formula that I want to talk to you about. He uses a phrase that perhaps you, uh, you might have seen it before, but never thought about it before. Um, and, and I shared this last week, but the phrase is, that he refers to is this. He says, the law of Christ. Paul refers to this phrase, the law of Christ. That's the first part of the formula, law of Christ. Now, what does that mean? What are you talking about? What does Paul mean when he talks about the law of Christ? The law of Christ was Paul's shorthand for Jesus' new covenant command. When Jesus, uh, um, during Holy Week, just as he was marching toward the cross, you might remember as he gathers for that last Passover supper on that Thursday evening, he says to his disciples, guys, I'm giving you a new command. This command supersedes all the other commands. I know you grew up Jewish. I know you have 613 Jewish laws in the Torah, but I'm giving you a new command because we're establishing, I'm establishing with you a new covenant. And the command was simple, and this is it. John chapter 13, beginning in verse 34, he says this, I give you a new command, and here it is, love one another. I'm giving you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And then he tells us what will happen if we do this. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so this new command that Jesus gives, it's interesting because it's a communal thing. It's a community thing. It's a, it's a family thing. It's not just, a, um, hey, you can love one another any way you want to love one another. Jesus would say here, he would clarify, he said, you are to take your cues from me. I set the tone. Follow my example. And so the Apostle Paul takes this idea, and I believe he uses it as this uniting ethic for all Jesus followers. And this phrase, the law of Christ, is the phrase that Paul uses to take his readers back to that night, back to this big idea. I think it's the marching orders for everyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus. In fact, let me give you the two examples. 1 Corinthians 9, here's what Paul writes. Writing to the church at Corinth, he says, Although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under, and here's that phrase, the law of Christ. To win those without the law. Okay, that's a lot of law, isn't it? (laughs) So here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, look, uh, I'm on a mission. I don't have a lot of time left. Um, I did a lot of damage to the church, so I'm trying to make up for lost time. And I'm willing to do anything short of sin to convince those that are far from Christ um, that Christ has done something in this world on their behalf. And so he's like, hey, if I need to become like a Jew, good news, I'm already a Jew, but if I need to become like a Gentile or somebody far from Christ, I will do that too. Like, this is the extreme to which Paul's willing to go. But he qualifies it in verse 21 by saying, I'm still under God's authority. This is what he's talking about here. He's like, I'm still under God's uh, authority. I'm just not under the old Jewish law, the Torah, and to which the Jewish hearers would have said, huh? Like, how's that possible? So you're saying you're under God's authority, but you're not under his law. You're not under the law of Moses. And so he just, he's continuing. He's like, well, I'm still under God's authority because I'm under the law of Christ. I'm under this new command. And what is the law of Christ? We're to love one another just as Jesus loved us. Let me give you the other place. We read this last week. It's Galatians 6, 2. It says, carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. 
So Paul says, hey, if you have a concern for someone or when the concerns of others concern you and you act on it, you're fulfilling the law of Christ. You're doing what Jesus told the disciples to do, to love each other as he loved them. Like These are the marching orders for followers of Jesus, loving others as Christ loved us. So then that leads us to the next part of the formula. So we start with the law of Christ as, as Jesus followers, regardless of our uh, political persuasion, the law of Christ over time as we grow in our faith should inform our conscience. And you're like, well, what does that mean? Well, what, what I mean by conscience is, is, is that inner mechanism that helps us navigate between right and wrong, right? That part of us that, that's, that's, uh, that, that navigates that should be hardwired to the law of Christ so that when we do something that's contrary to loving as Christ loved us, a little radar goes off. Like, it, it would bother us. Does that make sense? That, that if we are loving others, if we are being obedient to the law of Christ, and that becomes hardwired to our, our conscience, then, then it should disturb us. It, it should ding us. An alarm should go, oh, I'm not loving. And, and here's the deal. Not just our personal conscience, but this may be a, a, a little bit of a new concept for you. Our collective conscience as Christ followers. So, so not just as individuals, but the group of us. We should be irritated or convicted by some of the same things when we see them happening in society. We should all be convicted when we see an injustice. We should... We should all be convicted when we see somebody or a certain people group in society being disrespected. When we see people undermining their own lives, when we see people trying to undermine the concept of, of family, when we see them undermining their relationship with their kids, we should be moved by these things. These things should bother us. Our collective conscience is tied to this idea that we're to love other people, respect other people, recognize the dignity of other people in the way that Christ said, just as I have loved you. And so again, Jesus is saying, I want you to take your cue on how you are to love other people uh, from me. The law of Christ should inform our conscience. So let me give you a couple of quick examples because as simple as that is, there's a very powerful dynamic behind it. And this dynamic, I believe, has shaped Western culture. So let me give you a few examples. Let's talk about slavery for a second. For example, um, once upon a time, uh, everywhere in the world, in every town, village, household, neighborhood, kingdom, whatever, um, slavery was just understood to be a good thing. It was just normal. It was just a way of life. Like it wasn't even a question. It, it was just, it was the way of things. In fact, in 4th century BC, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, remarking about slavery said this. He said, for that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary, it's expedient. From the hour of their birth, some people are marked out for subjection and others for rule. In other words, there's just no way that the world would work without some people owning and controlling some other people. It was just obvious. But 4th century A.D., 800 years later, as Christianity had begun to take hold of the Roman Empire, St. Augustine, a Christian bishop, stood up and said, no, slavery is a sin. And all of a sudden, there was this like brand new idea that's being born. Like in a world where slavery is just part of the culture, suddenly it begins to dawn on Christians, hey, slavery might not be such a great idea. In fact, it's sinful. 
that they began to understand the Imago Dei, that people were made in the image of God. They began to understand this ethic that Paul is talking about, that this command from Jesus, this new command to love one another and treat each other just as Jesus loved us. And they began to, to look at that through the lens of owning other people, and they were like, this is, it's not okay. One more example. Once upon a time, in every kingdom, town, village, household, it was self-evident, it was obvious, it was like nobody questioned it, that infanticide, which is killing a child within the first year of its life, was an accepted practice and good for society. In the Roman world, this was called exposure. In fact, there were certain community laws and social laws in certain parts of the Roman Empire where you were required to allow your baby to die. Um, other times, it, it was because it was a girl, and this was a very patriarchal society, and you, you were to have sons and property and rights, and everything got passed down through uh, the sons, and so perhaps you had a girl and you didn't want a girl. Uh, you would just expose, that's the word, exposure, you would just expose your child, and the way it would work, and this is just horrible, but you would take uh, your baby and you would leave the village, you would go outside the gates of the village, and you would take your child, and you would just uh, set it down on the edge of the forest. Uh, you would take your child, and you would just set your child by a river, and then you would turn and walk away. And, and you would just let the fates decide the fate of your child. And the only rule was is that you couldn't take the life of the child yourself. This was just the way of things. This was just self-evident. But Christians, because of the love of Christ, were like, no, 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 no. This is not okay. And so what they began to do is when they would see a child sitting at the edge of the forest or down by a river, they would scoop that child up, bring him into their home, and raise him as their own. They did this because love required it. So as they began to understand what it, again, what it means to be made in the image of God, as they began to understand this law of Christ, loving others as Jesus loved us, right? And so suddenly there's this tension around um, what is just this expected practice in the Roman Empire, and Christianity begins to take hold begins to make inroads in the Roman Empire, and, and by the year 318, after embracing Christianity, Emperor Constantine declares infanticide a crime. Why? Because suddenly it became a socially conscious issue. Because of the teachings of, of Jesus and the unity of the church around the teaching of Jesus, and, and then you get like 60 more years down the road, and by 374, Emperor Valentinian made exposure, just setting your child somewhere to die, he made that a capital offense. So, so that if you did that and, and, and the, child, um, the life of your child was lost, you could lose, lose your life. See, when the law of Christ informs an individual, a, a village, or a city, or a nation's conscience, things begin to change. And there's been so much change even in our nation because of this very same dynamic. This is why I think the church is so important. Because it's our responsibility, again, in another place, Jesus said, to be salt and light. This is why we do this, so that we collectively, and not just those of us in this room, but our brothers and sisters in Christ and other churches uh, in this community, in, in this state, and uh, in our country, collectively, we be, be salt and light, and we begin to shift and transform the conscience of the nation. It's possible. And this is why we cannot be divided over political issues, over candidates, over political parties. Like it is incumbent upon us to figure out how to be one, just as Jesus prayed that we would be one. Then that leads us to the third part of the formula, and that's this. 
The law of Christ informs the conscience, and to an informed conscience, uh, we incorporate knowledge and wisdom. So one of the great advantages of humanity is we're able to collect information and pass it on to the next generation because of the written word. Hopefully, each generation becomes a little smarter than the generation before it, right? That, that, that's what we hope, that we have a little bit more insight, a little bit more wisdom to share. And as people of the 21st century, as we think about what it looks like to live this kingdom ethic, we should add to our informed conscience uh, the knowledge of science, the knowledge of um, psychology, the wisdom that comes with understanding things that we're learning about how the world works, the understanding of how our, our bodies are put together, how we're made. A very simplistic way to think about this, and this is not a rhetorical question, when your child, parents, when your child gets sick, um, who do you call? The doctor. Um, you call the doctor's office. You probably get a physician's assistant or a nurse, right? Um, you call a doctor. Here's who you don't call, me. You know why you don't call me? Because I don't know what I'm doing. But at one point in time, when your child got sick, do you know who they called? called the priest. They called the pastor. But we don't do that anymore. Why do we not do that? You guys have no tension there, right, at all. I mean, you completely understand that uh, I would pray for your sick child, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you understand that I don't know how to triage the situation. I, I don't know how to make your child better. That, that is not a tension point for us. Right? And so as Christians, we, because we believe in a mysterious creator who created everything, we should not be afraid of, rather, we should embrace science. We should be on the forefront of these things. We should never resist discovery. We should be the most curious people because our faith rests in the mystery and the unknown of a creator God. And so the law of Christ, loving one another, leads to an informed um, collective conscience, which combined with uh, you know, knowledge and wisdom and insight leads to the last part of the formula. We use all of that um, to determine which policies and platform and legislation we support. And here's the rub. When it comes to determining our policies and platform, there will always be disagreement among Christians. And, and the reason that's there, we talked a little bit about it last week. Do you remember? It was Miles' law. Rufus Miles. Back in the 1940s, I think he worked under the uh, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and, and Johnson administrations in the Bureau of the Budget. And he had this saying, where you stand depends on where you sit. And what he means by that statement is our cultural context, like where you live, who you're uh, related to, the family uh, of origin, how much money you had or you didn't have growing up, all of those things determine your perspective in life. It determines what you see to a certain extent, what you experience, how you see the world, how you interpret the world. I mean, the, the, the best piece of evidence would, would maybe be something like this, if I were to ask you, why did your dad always vote Republican growing up? Or why did, you know, Aunt Betty, and sorry to all the Bettys in the room, why did Aunt Betty always vote Democrat growing up? Why did she do that? If you were to ask him that question, or if I were to ask you that, your response, you know what it would be? It would probably have something to do with the cultural context that they grew up in, not their theology. It'd be like, well, she... They grew up as sharecroppers on a farm and blah, blah, blah. Like you would start to tell that story, not because, well, she was in the Word every single day and, well, it just shaped her, you know, her views. The same is true for you. The same is true for me. And that doesn't mean that we have to dismiss the significance of our faith. It's that when these two things come together, theology and politics, usually one props the other one up. And as I said in the first week, usually when you put theology and politics or church and politics together, politics always wins. But what if, 
like we were able to just step back from this just a little bit and see it just a little bit differently. Not necessarily change what you believe or who you vote for, although for some of you that might be the case, but just to begin to see this a little bit differently, again, because where you stand depends on where you sit. And so what now? What do we, we do next? Because we're always going to disagree, right? So I want to give you a few suggestions. This isn't complicated. This isn't anything new. This isn't anything you've never heard before. Three simple things. I think the way forward is, number one, listen. Just begin to listen. Like, just begin to listen to people in particular who are different from you, who see the world different from you, who have a, a different tone color to their skin, Perhaps people who were not born in our country and have immigrated here legally. Perhaps people who, you know, love our military and people who despise our military. People who are young, people who are old. Like, just listen to all kinds of different inputs. Step one is easy. Just begin to listen to people who've experienced the world differently, who have sat in a different seat in which you sat or currently. So listen to people. Second is this. Once you start listening, then learn something. Don't just say, okay, well, I checked it off. I listened, but I'm not going to think, right? Don't do that. Again, our, as Christians, our faith is in the all-powerful God. We don't need to be afraid of new information. We don't need to be afraid of differing opinions or opposite views. You can listen to that. No, no one's asking you to believe it, but you can listen to it, right? You can learn something from it. It, it, might, it might just reinform your own beliefs, like why you believe the things that you believe. So listen and and learn, be curious, be a student, not, not just a critic. Friend, if you're, if you're here, listen, and if you're a Democrat, uh, and don't raise your hand, but if you're a Democrat, your Republican brothers and sisters are not crazy. If you're here and you're Republican, your Democratic brothers and sisters are not crazy. Nobody's crazy. Okay, there's a few crazy people. <laughs> Mostly, they just sit in a different place than you, and they just see the world a little bit differently. And by the way, when we catch ourselves saying, I don't know how anybody could do that. I don't know how you could stand where you stand on that issue. I don't know how anybody could vote that way and call themselves a Christian. When you say that, do you know what you've done? You've said more about you than them. You've said, I don't understand. I, I don't understand. Okay, so listen and learn and try to understand. Why wouldn't we, especially in the body of Christ, take time to understand? And then finally, love. Um, never, ever, please never burn a relational bridge over a political view. That's just not worth it. And you're like, well, they started the fire. Okay, well, let them start it on their side of the bridge. Just don't start one on your side of the bridge. And this just goes back to Jesus' command, love one another. Just as I have loved you. This goes back to the cross. This goes back to the epicenter of everything we believe as Christ followers. Friends, the person next to you is more precious to God than your or their potentially flawed political view. And so why would we burn a relational bridge or have conflict with somebody for whom Jesus died? And I know as we've been in this series, some of you can't help but think, Alex, this is so naive. Do you really think this series is going to make any difference or change anyone's mind? 
just remember this. Once upon a time, there was a handful of Jesus followers being crushed by an empire. And they gave to Caesar what was Caesar's, and they gave to God that which was God's, their lives. And now, that empire is no more. And that emperor, that ruler, is nothing but a footnote in the history of Jesus of Nazareth. And so kingdoms come, and kingdoms go, and empires rise, and empires fall, and guys, one day the United States will not exist anymore. It's the way of things. But Jesus said, I've come to build my church, and the gates of hell, nothing can stop it. And he did. And we get to participate in that. And so that's why I just believe that we have a responsibility as the church to show our divided nation, our divided world, what it looks like to disagree politically and to still love one another unconditionally, and to maintain unity with one another. Because I believe at Calvary, at the cross, we lost our right to do anything less. And so may we be people who listen, learn, and love, and follow the path of Jesus. Amen? And let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for sending your son, Jesus. And we thank you for the law of Christ that Paul spoke of, this new command, Jesus, that you gave your disciples to love one another just as you love them. And so we look to you, Jesus, as our example, as our leader in this area, And we see so many of the things that you did, even back to that night, Jesus, where you sat behind every one of them and washed their feet and then knew some would betray you and leave you. You loved them in spite of that. And so we ask that you would give us that kind of love for each other. And that we would show the world around us what it looks like to have differing opinions and yet maintain that love for one another and that unity. And so maybe just be people who follow that example of your son Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Um, quickly, just a, a couple of announcements. Um, one, starting point is right after the service, about five, ten minutes. If you're here, um, just again, as CJ said, just head down the sidewalk this direction, down to our student building, the loft, and there'll be uh, some of our staff down there to greet you, and they'll uh, bring you in. You'll go ahead and start eating, and then I'll be down there in a few minutes, and we'll uh, jump into that meeting together, and if you are here and last minute you're like, oh, I'd love to go down there, uh, just come on down there. We'll just lay hands on the food and multiply it and bless it and hope we get more sandwiches. Um, so, and, and then just a reminder, next week we're going to wrap up this church, culture, and politics series, and we're going to talk about what it means to be people who influence people and talk about what it means to be people who influence people. Um, And uh, as we stand, would you go ahead and stand? Some members of our prayer team will be down front here after the service. And if you are here today and you would like to just pray with someone, if you're here and, and, uh, man, you just have some sin that you want to confess, that you want to repent of, perhaps you're here and you've just been hearing about this gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, and you Um, would like to profess your belief in him. Some members of our prayer team will be down here after the service, and they would love nothing more than to pray with you. And so as they're making their way down, let's read our benediction together. 
As God has forgiven us our sins, let us go joyfully into God's world, offering God's love, forgiveness, and peace. Go in peace, and the peace of God goes with you. Amen. You're dismissed.